Thank you so much for joining us today for our presentation on the EB-5 green card. My name is Dustin Saldariaga. I'm a senior associate at Scott Legal PC, and I'm joined today by Ian Scott, who's the founder of our firm. As I mentioned today, we're going to be talking about the EB-5 visa, which is also called a green card. Uh, broadly speaking, the EB-5 allows a person who invests $800,000 or $1,050,000 uh, into a business that then creates 10 full-time jobs. We'll talk about the uh, requirements for the EB-5 immigrant visa or green card, as well as the procedures for both regional center applications, as well as direct investment uh, applications. And we'll talk about that difference as well. We'll also talk about some practical considerations if you're moving to an EB-5 green card from a non-immigrant visa, like an E-2 visa. As I mentioned, we're very fortunate to have our firm's founder, Ian Scott, here today to speak with us. Ian has extensive experience preparing EB-5 green card applications, as well as navigating the uh, immigration system himself, himself uh, both uh, TNs, F1s, as well as an E2 visa, which uh, was actually uh, how he founded our law firm. And his experience navigating the process firsthand really does inform the way that we help our clients navigate the process themselves. So a few things before we get started. As, I, as, uh, as I've mentioned, we do handle business immigration cases extensively. Uh, however, we don't solely handle business immigration. So whether it's family immigration, humanitarian, whatever immigration issues you might have, we do hope that you'll reach out to us for help. This webinar is part of a series. We at this point are doing at least one webinar a week, I would say, and those cover a variety of topics. So after this presentation, we'll send you a link where you can sign up for our future webinars, and we do hope to see you on those as well. We'll also send you after this presentation a copy of the PowerPoint presentation that you see on your screen, as well as a link uh, to our YouTube channel. This webinar is being recorded and we do post our full length webinars onto our YouTube channel as well as shorter videos as well and those are on a variety of immigration topics as well. So do check those out. If you have a question during the presentation, you can send it to us through either the chat box or the Q&A box on zoom and we will be monitoring those actively. Uh, we plan to get through all the questions. We might save your question for the end of the presentation, uh, but either way, uh, we do expect to get through all of those. Um, and as I mentioned, this webinar is being recorded. Please do be aware of that. Without further delay, let's go ahead and dive in. And we'll start by talking about the difference between the regional center uh, EB-5 option and the direct investment EB-5 option. These are really the two main pathways to apply for an EB-5 green card. And again, the basis of an EB-5 green card, it's called a job creation green card. So uh, really to get an EB-5, you make an investment into a business or a regional center, and that investment then needs to directly lead to the creation of at least 10 full-time equivalent jobs. So that's a fundamental requirement that applies to any EB-5 application. But within those requirements, there are two pathways, the regional center and the direct investment. Let's talk about the regional center first. This is the most common pathway of the two, most common option of the two to get an EB-5 green card. And basically what a regional center allows you to do is to be a fairly passive investor. Uh, a regional center is an entity that is registered with the government that basically can collect um, the investments uh, of various EB-5 investors, and they pool that investment into a single large project. Now, these are oftentimes the cre creation and construction of uh, resorts, uh, could be a metro station, could be a shopping center. We're talking tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars that go into these regional center projects. They tend to be very large. But as, as a result, they are of a size where they can pool the investments of dozens of EB-5 investors. So 
The benefit of an EB, uh, EB5 regional center application is it does allow you to be fairly passive. You would invest your money into the regional center. You don't have an active role in the management of that investment. Um, you do tend to have higher administration fees uh, because someone is running the business, so you do have to pay for that. Um, and the investment return tends to be fairly low. So, uh, you know, these are generally not um, opportunities to really increase your return on investment. Um, another key benefit of a regional center option is that you can count as part of your employment. I mentioned before that your investment needs to lead to the employment of at least 10 full-time equivalent workers. With a regional center application, indirect employment does count. So for example, if there is a resort being built, um, contractors, construction workers, um, independent contractors, those can all count uh, toward that job requirement. Um, and typically that would be calculated and handled by the actual regional center. So again, a regional center tends to be a fairly hands-off application process where the regional center handles a lot of that work. A regional center is really a great option if you have funds available to invest, you want a green card, and you don't want to have a very active role in the business that is underlying the green card application, okay? In contrast to a regional center is the direct investment option. A direct investment option looks a lot more like a traditional business. So as an example, let's say that you uh, have $800,000 that you want to invest in a restaurant, then you have a uh, experience developing restaurants, starting them, growing them, and you want to put that $800,000 into your restaurant. Um, that would be a direct investment project. A direct investment project can only support one EB-5 investor. This changed in, uh, in the last year or so. Uh, before that, you could have uh, more than one EB-5 investor through a direct investment project. So you could have a restaurant that would support, say, two EB-5 investors, each of whom would invest the required funds into the business. But now, if you were to apply today, uh, through the direct investment option, you can only support one EB-5 investor through a direct investment project. Um, now, let's talk about the pros and cons. You have significant control over the direct investment project. If it's your restaurant, you are responsible for, for managing that restaurant. Um, you need to account for how that EB-5 investment is being used to create those 10 jobs. Uh, on the positive side, you have the potential for an and enormous return depending on how the business goes. Uh, if your restaurant does extremely well, you could make a lot of money. Or if, if you're starting another business that generates a profit, you could have a very high return. Uh, in contrast to a regional center, which tends to have a low return. Now, uh, for a direct investment, only direct jobs count. So for example, if your investment is into a restaurant, only employees who are directly employed by the restaurant will count. So these are W-2 employees employed by the restaurant. Um, you cannot count, for example, if you're hiring a contractor to build the restaurant, that does the, that contractor's uh, payments to to their workers would not count. Uh, whereas for a regional center, you you could count those contractors, and you could even count. Uh, switching back to the regional center real quick, you could even count jobs that are created indirectly. So, for example, if you're if the investment is a resort and it is generating, you know, the local it's it's stimulating the local economy, you could arguably include those jobs as well. Direct investment does not allow you to do that. So these are direct W-2 employees you need to create those 10 positions for. Um, now, um, you see on your screen, the program is not subject to reauthorization. That requires a little bit of context. So when the EB-5 program was created in the early 1990s by Congress, by the US Congress, it was the direct investment program that was created. So that program, was created in the early 1990s and has continued since that date. It is not subject to congressional reauthorization. However, the regional center program was uh, not created under that initial 
uh, law, that initial legislation. So that program, the regional center, does sometimes expire if Congress does not reauthorize that it reauthorize it. So we saw in 2022, for example, that the regional center program came to a standstill for about eight months. Uh, I believe it was eight months. Um, and that could happen again. Now, when Congress reauthorized it in 2022, 2023, they said that it's reauthorized through, I believe, 2026. We'll talk about that again uh, later, a bit more later. Uh, so you shouldn't have a problem until 2026 or so, but there is always the looming possibility come 2026 or, or thereafter that the regional center pro program could pause or even not be re reauthorized, whereas a direct investment option does give you that security that the program is not just going to be paused or end just because Congress uh, these days tends to be fairly dysfunctional. Um, now, for a direct investment, you may have, and Ian is going to talk more about moving from an E2 to an EB5, there is the opportunity with certain caveats that you can use your E2 investment towards your EB5 investment. Now, that investment is either $800,000 or a million and fifty thousand dollars So it is a significant amount. So if you've invested into your E2 business, uh, you know, it could be beneficial to use those funds. The direct investment could allow that. Uh, and overall, the direct investment option is really for that applicant that has a business idea that really wants to have an active role managing the business. So let's talk about, I've hinted at a few of the EB-5 requirements. Let's look explicitly at what they are. The first requirement is you need to invest your personal funds into what is called a new commercial enterprise. A new commercial enterprise is really the underlying project. So for a regional center, it could be, like I said, a metro station, a shopping center, a resort. Uh, it could be for a direct investment, your restaurant. It could be really any business that you're, you're looking to develop. That would be your new commercial enterprise. And the new commercial enterprise is what needs to create the job. So the investment amount would either be $800,000 or a million and fifty thousand dollars Why the difference? It depends on whether the uh, business is located in what is called a targeted employment area. So basically, uh, the government wants to encourage EB-5 investors to invest in places that that are either rural or they're experiencing um, high unemployment. So, and it makes sense, right? If you have foreign investors who are looking to put money into the US, you want them to direct that money into areas that will, that really do need more jobs. Um, and, and so if you are willing to do that by investing in what is called a targeted employment area, your investment amount, the required investment amount is reduced to $800,000. If instead you wanna start a business uh, in the middle of Manhattan or an affluent area, uh, your required investment amount would be a million and fifty thousand dollars. Now, I will say that you can, you may be surprised by what areas are targeted employment areas. The government uh, does tend to allow areas that um, you wouldn't otherwise think of being either rural or high unemployment, but by connecting them uh, with areas, other areas, you may be able to get that lower investment amount. Uh, in areas that you wouldn't think you could. So it's worth talking with a lawyer and figuring out what area actually is a targeted employment area. Um, what investment can be included? So again, fundamentally, the EB-5 is a job creation green card. Uh, you need to show that your investment led to the creation of jobs. So if you have um, invested, you, you've, you've, let's say you've hired 10 people at your E2 business, and then you invest a million dollars, uh, but you haven't hired anyone, that investment amount is not going to count. You need to show how the investment amount actually led to the creation of jobs. Now, we'll also talk about documenting the source of funds. This is listed in, in the second uh, headline on, on the um, uh, PowerPoint presentation you see. Uh, you, you need to show where you got the money. So the money needs to have been lawfully acquired, legitimately acquired. Um, it needs to be your personal funds. So it's not a good idea if your parents are gifting you the money to have them directly transfer the money to the new commercial enterprise. They need to transfer that money to you. It needs to be your money and then you are transferring it into the business. There, there are, frankly, this is 
certainly one of the most challenging aspects of the EB-5 is documenting where you got the money from and how the money flowed from the source into the EB-5 investment, uh, the new commercial enterprise. So it is certainly worthwhile to talk with an attorney as soon as you start thinking about where that money will come from. We do recommend that you talk with an attorney just to make sure you have the documentation that the pathway that you plan to follow is is a good one and you're not going to run into hurdles along the way. Um, investments can be made over time. Uh, it does not have to be made in one lump sum. And also, uh, frankly, EB-5 applications take a long time. So the first stage, um, you, you see if you look at the fourth headline on your screen, you see EB-5 filing and then you see I-526. The I-526 is step one of applying for an EB-5. It is basically uh, the application to the government that explains what the new commercial enterprise is, where your investment is coming from, but you don't actually need to have created the jobs by the time you file the I-526. Um, also the I-526, the government estimates it takes them about five years or longer to adjudicate the I-526, and that's an extremely long time. So you can, there are, there are times, cases when you can make that investment over time and you don't have to have invested the full million and fifty thousand dollars before you submit uh, that application. Um, we'll talk a bit more about the process later. Um, investments versus retained earnings. So again, your, these need to be your personal funds. So let's say you have an E2 company, it has a million dollars in retained earnings. You actually have to distribute those funds to yourself pay taxes on them, and then reinvest them into the company if you're going to consider them as an, the EB-5 investment. Again, they have to be your personal funds. So retained earnings by the company are not considered to be your personal funds. You do have to distribute those before they're reinvested. And differences between the E-2 and EB-5, there are many. Um, there, First of all, the investment amount. EB-5 has a strict investment amount. The E-2 does not. The E2, you need to invest what's necessary for the business to be operational. Also, um, the job requirement is different. Job creation requirement is different. The E2, uh, we generally recommend three full-time equivalent workers over the course of five years. Um, EB5 has a strict 10 um, full-time equivalent workers. Also, um, the E2, there's certainly more flexibility about the investment leading to the uh, employment. So if you buy, you know, if you buy a business that already employs people, those people will count. Whereas for an EB-5, that's not the case. Your investment needs to go toward the creation of those jobs. But there are a number of other differences between the E2 and EB-5. Overall, EB-5 is a far stricter uh, process. Um, the government is going to scrutinize the source of funds much more than it would the E2. Um, so, so EB-5 is just a more intense, uh, labor intensive application. I already mentioned the first challenge source of funds. Um, uh, so equity investment, um, I'm not going to talk too much about that. Um, but, um, you do need to be very careful about how you are going about purchasing the EB-5 company. Um, so for example, if you are buying a business from someone as your EB-5 investment, it's very important that your funds not go to the seller of the business, because if that happens, it's not clear that your funds are creating the job. So you need to be very thoughtful about how the funds are actually transferred into the business to create uh, the jobs. Job creation. 10 full-time jobs, again, indirect jobs can be counted through the regional center program. That can be contractors, that can be jobs created uh, by this, uh, the local economy being stimulated by the, the, the um, project, EB-5 project, whether it's a resort, a shopping mall, etc. That's not the case for a direct investment. So direct investment has to be 10 full-time equivalent W-2 employees. Um, you can apply with a detailed business plan. So if you haven't already accomplished all of the requirements before you apply, um, many applicants have not, so that's not a reason not to apply. You would just need to focus on a very detailed and comprehensive business plan that shows the government how you are going to achieve those benchmarks. Um, 
the investment amount, the employment figures. Um, and again, there needs to be a link between your investment and the creation of those 10 jobs. Um, docu documenting full-time positions and qualified workers. So uh, you, you would include in your application that you're paying um, W-2 workers. Um, you want to be careful about who you're employing. So non-immigrant visa holders tend not to count for the EB-5. You do want to look at U.S. citizens and uh, permanent residents for those jobs. And again, the process of applying for an EB-5 starts with the I-526. That can take five years or longer. We actually have uh, an active litigation practice at our firm where we sue the government to compel it to decide these applications faster. That is how problematic the delays have become. Um, after your I-526 is approved, you would then file an I-485, which is an application for a green card. And once that is approved, you're given a conditional green card um, uh, that you would have for a couple years. And then you would file the I-829, which is the third form you see listed there. That is an application to remove the conditions on your green card. Um, so as you can tell, it, this is a multi-year process. Um, could be seven years or longer by the time you actually have your permanent green card without conditions in hand. So go into this uh, ready to be patient. Um, that being said, we will talk a little bit later about how the government, um, with its re reauthorization over the last year or two, did say that you can file the I-485 con concurrently with the I-526 if you're within the U.S., and that means you can get travel authorization and a work permit at the time you file the I-526 and I-485. You can apply for that. So, so generally uh, between six months and a year after you file, um, <clears throat> you can have a travel permit and work authorization. So that's a big help. Um, so a few of these key changes to the EB-5 program I've already mentioned. Uh, in the last year or two, the program was reauthorized by Congress through September 30th, 2027. And as I mentioned, the program did expire. Um, the regional center program did expire uh, over, the la over the last year or two in 2022. Um, and so when Congress reauthorized the program, they said that through September 30th, 2026, applications will be adjudicated so that the program should not lapse again until that time. Could happen afterward. Um, the minimum investment amount when the program was re reauthorized was increased from half a million to $800,000. And again, that's for targeted employment area applications, as well as a few other categories that I'll talk about in, in a few seconds. Um, the maximum investment amount was slightly increased to a million and fifty thousand dollars when the program was reauthorized. And um, the targeted employment area rules did change when the program was reauthorized. And now the US government determines what a targeted employment area is. So uh, it's become a little bit harder to, um, to be, to ex kind of expand where targeted empl employment areas are. And finally, this last bullet point on your screen actually is very significant. So 32% of the EB-5 visas are set aside for specific types of EB-5 projects. And those include um, <clears throat> for businesses or projects located in rural areas, those located in high unemployment areas, those two existed before the reauthorization. But now we also have infrastructure projects. So uh, if, if you're investing in a government infrastructure project, that could also qualify. Uh, here's why that those set asides are especially important. If you are were born in India or China, there is a significant delay for the availability of EB-5 green cards, unless you are applying under one of these categories. So if you, you were born in China or India in particular, you would probably want to find a project uh, it would typically be a regional center project that focuses on rural areas, un high unemployment areas, or infrastructure projects. And that may allow you uh, to have a green card that's, that's not backlogged, uh, which could save years off of the process. So do, do keep that in mind. And also what that means is if you're already inside the U.S. and you were born in, in India or China, um, 
then when you file the I-526, if you're applying under one of these categories and it's current on the visa bulletin, you can file your I-485 at the same time, which will allow you to apply for work authorization and travel authorization at the same time, which is a huge, huge benefit rather than having to wait years for the green card to become available. Um, I've already talked, that's what I was just talking about, this first bullet on the screen, concurrent filing, huge benefit. Um, another change is that the source of funds, I mentioned before that you need to very clearly show where you got the money from, and this is essentially a financial audit. You want to trace every single dollar that you invest into the EB-5 project from its source to the EB-5 project. Um, that has now extended to administrative fees. So administrative fees, oftentimes, you know, you'll invest in a regional center pro project, the required investment is 800,000, but then there's an additional $30,000 for administrative fees. That 30,000 does not count toward the $800,000 investment requirement. In the past, you didn't have to show where that $30,000 administrative fee came from, now you do. So you need to prove the source of funds for the administrative fee in addition to the EB-5 investment amount. Um, so ability to change programs if the regional center fails or closes. Now, fortunately, um, unfortunately, sometimes regional centers will fail. There, there may be problems with uh, the management of the regional center. Any number of things can come up. And so it is important to go through a reputable regional center. Um, however, if the regional center does fail, the government has now included certain protections uh, that allow good faith investors to complete the permanent residence application process in spite of the regional center being terminated. Um, and again, there are certain protections that if Congress fails to reauthorize the program, the application could still be adjudicated. <clears throat> Though if you are very concerned about that point, you do want to do that direct investment option because the regional center, frankly, is is for the foreseeable future going to be subject to congressional reauthorization. So with that, I will go ahead and pass it off to Ian to speak about other EB-5 considerations. Great. Thank you very much, Dustin. Yes, that was very, very, very helpful. And, uh, you know, the, the last one of the last points that you talked about with respect to, you know, the situation where someone invests in a regional center and then the regional center, um, you know, something happens to it. That's one that we are, our firm is actually familiar with where we had a client and the client had invested in a regional center um, and the regional center had all sorts of issues with the people that were running the regional center and um you know the the, the person uh, wasn't able to get the the green card as a result of that so you definitely have to uh, they they this particular person was lucky they got the green card another way but uh, but uh you know you definitely have to make sure that you are uh, you know kind of picking a reputable regional center and doing your due diligence and that's unfortunately something an immigration attorney can't help you with but you can get an investment advisor to uh to look at look at the investment because it is an investment just like any other any other investment so a few things to you know you know Dustin covered a lot of great territory with respect to to, to EB5 a few kind of Final things to consider, um, you know, the, the, well, there's a case. It's, you know, I'll describe this in terms of a, 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 the, one of the very first BB5 cases when the investment amount was only five hundred thousand dollars. And what the person did, it was a direct investment um, case. And what the person did is they put five hundred thousand dollars in a business bank account. They had a three-page business plan saying that they were going to, you know, do X, Y, and Z. And then applied for an EB5, and they were denied. And they they had lawyers and. <laughs> Lawyers appealed the case and said, well, this meets the regulation. They invested, they set up an entity, they invested, et cetera. And the case is named Matter of Ho. That's the, the name of the case. And really what Matter of Ho said that, no, that's not sufficient. You can't just, if you have a direct investment, you can't just take money and put it in a bank account. You have to also show either that you've spent some of the money or that you have commitments to spend. So commitment might be that you've already hired an employee or have a contract to hire an employee. A commitment might be a lease and you know there's going to be payments that are going to be made over time. The commitment could be that you've hired contractors. So you don't actually have had to have paid the contractors yet, but um, but you know, but but you've hired contractors, um, you have a contract with them. 
and that's a commitment to spend over time. So, uh, you know, we, we, this is something that's very important, especially if you are, um, you know, if you, especially if you own the company 100%, because in that case, in matter of Ho, that was the case. And what the, uh, the uh, appeals board said was that, well, no, this person could just take the money out of the company and, um, you know, and, 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 and spend it on, on themselves if they wanted to. Um, and it doesn't constitute what's called an at risk investment. So, um, so it, and it doesn't mean that you have to spend everything. We've been successful with that same era where it was 500,000 and the person had spent under 500 under 100,000 rather and had very few commitments for the rest of the money that was there but it just can't be as far as far as matter of as the matter of whole case was there are many issues with that case but that was one of them the question of loans and gifts so you know let's say the 800,000 or the 1 million 50,000 the question of can it come from a loan or can it can the investment come from a gift? And the apps, the answer is absolutely yes for both of them. So let's start with gifts. So gifts, no problem. The money can come from a gift from anybody. It can be a relative. It can be from a stranger. If you find a stranger that that, that wants to gift you that kind of money, it, it's permitted under the regulations. And I, I say it's permitted because the government wanted to change it to only uh, allow gifts from immediate relatives, but um, they they backed off and they didn't make that change in March of 2022. But you, um, so the gift can come from anybody. However, you do have to show where that person who gave the gift got the money from. So the exact same source of funds analysis has to be conducted on the person giving the gift. And the other thing to consider is if the person is giving the gift, the person has to give the money to you. So believe it or not, USCIS has denied petitions where let's say a parent gives the child, the son or daughter money. And instead of giving them the money, maybe the parents thought if they put the money in the bank account of the child for even a day, they might spend some of it. So instead of giving them the money, they actually gave the money directly to the regional center and those petitions were denied right so it's uh, and the reason the government says is that the child never had possession of in control of the money the person who has the that's receiving the gift has never had possession and control of the money and so they didn't invest right so that's that that's USCIS's uh, position and it's a position that has not been challenged right um so so we, you know when we when people are investing in a regional center or if we're structuring something where someone's doing a direct investment and they're getting money, we always have very, very explicit language to say that the money has to go to the investor before it is um, put into the, um, the the company. Now, let's look at loans. So loans as well are, are permitted. The loan can be unsecured. And the, I, this is a, it's an interesting one because the government initially allowed unsecured loans and then years passed where they were approving the petitions then all of a sudden they decided that an unsecured loan um you know wasn't consistent with the regulations and they started denying petitions but then um you know given the legal system a lot of people said well no that's a misinterpretation of the regulations and so they sued the US government and they won because the courts also said that an unsecured loan was uh it complied with the regulations so the loan can be unsecured and the loan can be secured as well against your personal assets the only issue is that if the loan is secured against your personal assets then you have to show where you got the money so the exact same source of funds analysis has to be done on the security, right? So it's uh, sometimes can be a bit complicated and kind of, kind of, kind of, you know, let, let's say, let's say that you, you know, you, you, you um, obtained a, you know, a loan from your house to an equity, home equity loan. And, um, and you said, okay, my loan, my source of funds is really easy. I just got a loan from a bank of $800,000 and it's based on my home. Well, unfortunately, no, you have to then go back and look at where did you get the money to buy the house and do the exact same analysis, source of funds analysis on that. And then the one loan that's not type of loan that's not permitted is if the business itself is the security. If the E two business is the security, then that would uh, that wouldn't that wouldn't work. The other very interesting thing with EB five petitions is the idea of when we look at E twos, for example. Let's say someone was wanted an E two and they bought a restaurant and they said, um, "Okay, I'm going to pay." Let's let's say it was an expensive restaurant. I'm going to pay $800,000 for this restaurant and I'm going to give the money to the seller and I'm going to take over the restaurant, right? So even if they were buying all the assets of the restaurant, let's say that, you know, that works fine for E2. That's no problem at all. But that does not work for EB-5 because EB, with EB-5, the funds have to be, the investment has to be linked to job creation. And the government says that if the money goes to the seller, that is not going towards job creation at all. Now, there are some extreme examples that we won't get into here where there's a troubled business 
is, and then there are some except, well, not extreme examples, we just call them exceptions that we won't get into here. But generally speaking, a purchase business is not going to work uh, unless you purchase the business, give the money to the seller, oh, and then invest another 800000 or one million fifty thousand in the business. That's one way that it could work. The other way that it could possibly work is if you actually, instead of giving the money to the seller, like let's say someone has a business and they say, hey, I want to take you as a business partner. I'll give you 50% of my shares. And then you can invest the money in the business. And now the you're investing the money in the business and the business is going to grow. And then the money's in the business and the money gets spent in the business. That could work as well. Like in that, that, that scenario of purchasing a business could work as well. Just keep in mind with that scenario, though, the employees that are there don't count towards the 10 full-time employees employees that, um, you know, that, um, that, uh, that have to be hired. And, and keep in mind that the people, the 10 full-time employees that have to be hired, the government doesn't accept part-time. They have a, you know, concept of job sharing, which we always discourage people from, from utilizing it because it's very difficult to document. So it is full-time employees. And the other thing to remember with those full-time employees is that they have to be green card holders or U.S. citizens. So it's not just anybody who's here legally working, but green card um, holders and U.S. or U.S. citizens. And we always encourage people to make sure that if they are you know, utilizing this program, particularly if you're, they're using the direct investment to uh, apply for E-Verify, because we have had a situation, we had an I-526 petition that we filed, and the, we received an RFE, and we had submitted some employment information, not to prove job creation, because the person, people have two years after the I-526 has been approved to do that. But the government came back and noticed that some of the people that we submitted green card documents for were fake, right? Not that we knew they were fake or not that even the employer knew that they were fake, but people who you know, presented to the employer fake green cards, and they didn't tell us which ones they were, right? So we said to the um, the people, well, we, we said we responded to the government and said, listen, this isn't, you know, we don't, we have lots of time to create the job. We were just showing you that you that we could create jobs, and they approved the petition. But we, you know, we said to the the, the employers to register for E-Verify, and it's important to do it immediately, like right when you start the business, because what we learned with that employer, for example is there in California. And, and I, I have no idea what the logic was behind this or is behind this. But apparently, if you don't do the e-verify verification at the beginning, you can't later, once someone is working there, go back and utilize the e-verify system. And again, I'm not, I haven't investigated the reason for that, but when, um, you know, we asked, now that we're doing the I-829 for this particular um, client with the removing of the conditions, we asked them to go and re-verify everyone. And apparently it's not permitted in California. So, um, so it, you know, you can only do it at the beginning. So something to keep in mind. The other kind of thing is, you know, with E2, you have to own 50%. There's no investment amount that you have to own, but you have to own some percentage. It has, does have to be an equity investment, just as Dustin said. So it can't be structured as like a loan. You say, okay, I'm going to give $800,000 and, you, you know, there's a loan agreement where you get the money back. That that doesn't work at all. That would be automatic denial. But you could own a fraction of a percentage or whatever percentage, or you could own 100%. It doesn't matter. And then the other kind of thing you can't have is any guaranteed return, right? So th this is kind of works in a few different ways. You can't say, okay, well, you know, the business is going to pay you 5%. But you also can't have any type of redemption agreement saying that, you know, if the person wants to, for some reason, you know, sell their investment, that they're permitted to do that. And um, this is what the amount that the company will buy their investment back for, because that's impermissible as well under the regulations. And then the, the moving from E2 to EB5, I think one of the key things to keep in mind is so the source of funds analysis. The source of funds analysis for E2 is quite straightforward, but for EB5, it's extremely extensive. The other thing to keep in mind is that some of the, like E2 is quite permissive with respect to which investment amounts can be included. We can include legal fees. We can include other administrative fees, really anything related to getting the business up and running. Whereas um, for EB5, you can't, you can't do that. And you have to really be careful of the, the, the investment, even what you pay yourself, because none of the, the if you're in the, the investor, none of the money that you pay yourself can come from the investment. So you do have to to, to make sure that you um you know you're you're tracking. And we talked about um, the job creation, um, you know, the difference between purchasing a business and and starting a business, and also for E 2s when you're you know doing a renewal, you're not as focused on E Verify. Normally, the government will accept the documentation that you show them that um, you you know you have pay employees, payroll records, for example. They'll they'll uh, they'll accept that. And and as I said, we talked about buying a business already. Okay. 
<clears throat> so let's go through an example to talk about some of the things that we um, we we've 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 gone through. So in this example, Helen has an E2 visa and she got the E2 visa in 2015 uh, and she purchased a business and she purchased a business for $300,000 and it had five employees and she paid the lawyer another $40,000. So, you know, so she spent already $340,000. At the end of 2019, she took another 500, she got another $500,000 and that was given to her as a gift. And the person who gave the gift got the money from the sale of property they inherited 15 years ago, right? So someone had property that they, that they inherited many years ago. Um, so keep in mind, they've inherited it many years ago. So that means the person had it, the person who passed away had it. And, um, you know, and, 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 you know, you'll, you'll see where we're going with this. Um, but instead of giving the money to Helen, they deposited the money directly into Helen's business bank account, right? So that's, 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 uh, you know, as we said earlier, that's a no, no. Um, when the money was invested, she had the 500,000, the additional 500,000, she had 10 full-time employees, right? She had five to start, right? So she was able to hire another five employees. And but then at the end of 2019 as well, she paid herself a bonus of a hundred thousand and the company that year made a, made a million dollars, but she, she paid herself a bonus of a hundred thousand. And then in the beginning of the year, January, 2020, she applied for, um, you know, an EB five and, uh, you said that she's invested $1.8 million, right? And um, she said the initial 300,000 plus the 500,000 plus the 1 million that the company made, right? So so because, you know, that will be spent in 2020, uh, 2020. So that's, she invested that as well. That's what she's claiming. She also created information that she's already created the 10 full-time job. So has met that requirement. And she might hire some more employees, but she doesn't really want to. And she's in a located in an area where the unemployment rate is 7%. And so one thing is with this example, let's just assume that it's today. So we're going to use the the, the EB-5 amounts based on today's uh, date, right? Which is 800,000 and 1 million 50,000. So let's go through this. What are some of the issues, right? So one issue is that Helen, you know, the E-2, she purchased a business from someone for $300,000. So that doesn't count for EB-5, right? So the entity itself can still qualify for EB-5, but any money that counts towards the 800,000 or the 1 million and 50,000 has to be new investment. Now, in this instance, the unemployment rate of where she is located is 7%. So she will qualify for the 800,000 because if you if we look at the national unemployment rate, even if it's 3.5% right now or 3.6, but even if it was four, and I know it's not that high, then 1.54 is 6%. So we, we, you know, we, we know already that she's going to be in a, in a TEA. So she's only going to have to invest 800,000. Now also, you know, this $40,000 that she spent on legal fees, even though that didn't go to the seller and um, you know was paid paid to an external party, maybe even paid through the company, who knows? But to be like, even if it was paid through the company, it doesn't matter. For EB-5, uh, legal fees admin and administrative fees don't count towards the investment. So right now, um, Helen has zero investment um, for her EB-5 um, investment. So now let's say that... Um, you know, Helen has, um, you know, in 2019, she got $500,000 from, um, you know, someone, I don't know if it's a friend or relative, who knows, but she, you know, $500,000 from someone. So let's see. So gifts are permitted for EB-5, but remember that we have to show where that person got the money from. And, and USCIS does, I can't stress enough how they do not care how long ago it was or how difficult it is to get the information. So the fact that it was inherited, that someone died, it's that, that, you know, that their records aren't available, those types of things, they don't care about it, right? They don't care at all. So if she can't get the documentation from the friend who gifted her the money, then that's, you know, that, 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 that's not going to, to work. But now Helen's petition was dead on arrival, though, because, because the person deposited the money directly into Helen's business bank account rather than giving it to Helen so that she could put it in her personal bank account and then transfer it over. But so that's, you know, that's another huge problem, but, um, but we'll go on. So now, you know, when she, you know, her 500,000 was invested, she had 10 full-time employees, right? So now keep in mind that she had zero investment when this started, we went through that. And now she's invested 500,000 at the end of 2019, when the company had 10 full-time employees. So how many full-time employees can count? We know the five can't count, right? The ones that were there before, but she hadn't invested anything before. So none of the employees in this case count, not 
not any of them because the none of the actual investment went towards because there was zero investment before the 500,000 because the 500,000 I'm just assuming for the purposes of this like the let's say the friend actually depot gave it to her um, and she invested it the 500,000 could have counted if she could prove source of funds and if the money wasn't deposited into the business bank account. However, that 500,000 had nothing to do with the 10 full-time employees that were currently working in the company. So that's, you know, it, it doesn't, you know, so right now she's at zero employees and possibly 500,000 investment. If we just change the example a little bit to say that she actually had the um, money put directly into um, her personal account instead of the business account. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is at the end of 2019, so the same year that she got the 500000 and invested it in the business, she paid herself $100,000. Now, in this case, it looks okay because the company made a million dollars. However, let's say the company only made $90,000, then this would not be okay. That would kill the petition as well, because that would mean that she's invested $500,000. She's paid herself $100,000. The company only made ninety, so 10000 of her bonus came from the investment, right? And that's not permitted, right? So you have to be very careful when you're um, calculating, uh, you know, if there's money that the company made, you can attribute that money to her bonus, but you do have to be very careful when you're going through this um, to make sure that you are not um, counting money that was paid to you as investment, because that clearly can't count. And so we, you know, we say she applied on the 20th, sorry, the first 2020, the 300,000 obviously doesn't count, the 500, even if we say that counts, we, you know, it's still not going to be enough. And then the $1 million, you know, that, that she's including, which is retained earnings is irrelevant for the purposes of, of EB-5, unless that money was paid out to her, she paid taxes on it, got the, the you know, the money went to a personal account, and then it was reinvested. So so, um, and then we talked about employees um, as already. So this example, it goes through a lot of different um, concepts uh, for, for EB-5, but definitely things you have to be careful of, it's in particular when you're doing a um, direct investment, as Dustin said, the pros and cons of the regional center versus the direct investment program. The regional center, it really is for someone who doesn't want to have to worry about any of this, right? Because they, they've picked a reputable regional center. And keep in mind the majority, like over a majority, like, you know, of, of regional centers are, um, let me rephrase that. You can find regional centers that are reputable, that post information about how many projects they have um, done, that post information about their approval rates, et cetera. There, there are a lot of regional centers. So I can't say the majority of them are, are reputable. I have no idea because some of them are quite new. But um, but there but you know if you did do your research, you can find regional centers that have been around for a long time and have returned people's money and, and different things like that. So. So other, you know, some final things to consider, timing considerations, um, EB-5 petitions take a long time to be adjudicated. They take, um, for the I-526 petition, they take could take five years to be adjudicated. We often sue the U.S. government to say that they're moving too slowly, but the government is not backing down on these, right? So unless your petition has been outstanding for four or five years, the government is likely going to file a motion to dismiss, which doesn't mean that you won't you'll lose. We've had great success with, with suing the U.S. government even after a three-year period and winning, but it doesn't mean you're going to win. And, and they're quite, they can be expensive, right? Because, you know, most lawyers won't do them on a flat fee. We certainly don't. So the um, the other thing, you know, to keep in mind with timing considerations is the country-specific quotas, right? So, um, you know, as Dustin mentioned, if you are from uh, born in China or born in India, there's going there's there could be a much longer wait. Now, as Dustin also mentioned, the the car, those carve outs are very important because all of those category categories are current for all countries. If you are in a high unemployment, a rural, or a infrastructure project, so that's something to keep in mind. And the final thing to keep in mind with respect to timing is that. When you invest in a rural area, because of the March uh, 2022 uh, regulations, if you invest in a rural area, the timing associated with those petitions is around six months. And this was something actually I just learned uh, at a conference I, I went to recently. But 
the um, the the timing is six months for those petitions. So you just have to be careful if you're investing in a regional center because the regional center could be based on a rural um, area, but the the regional center has to have a prior approval. It's a, just of the name of a form. It's going to be meaningless to you. So, but they have to have that prior approval to get that kind of expedited um, processing. But if you had it, for example, a situation where uh, you had a direct investment or a regional center that was in a rural area, um, then those petitions are being adjudicated in six months. Months. So that's quite a difference from five years. So something to consider as you are, um, you know, if you're looking for particular regional centers and and or direct um, investment. If you if you know if if you direct investment and you can because the employees have to be working in that area, right? That's the whole thing with uh, the reason they're giving giving the benefit. So if you have, you know, if you're in the United States and you have a visa already, you just have to kind of make sure that with these long timing considerations that you are considering them, because if you have a pending petition, it could be more difficult to renew your non-immigrant visa, depending on what type of an immigrant visa that is and whether it's a dual intent visa or not. So if you're on a TN and you do EB-5, you want to, you know, make sure that you have your a basis to, to kind of continue to apply for a TN in the U.S. while you're waiting. Um, um, if your desire is to be in the United States while you're waiting. And we do have people that have, uh, you know, kind of conduct kind of parallel green card strategies where they have, you know, we had someone that she, she was actually approved for direct investment EB-5, but then she also was doing the NIW because the green card process is the, the NIW, pro sorry, the EB-5 process is a long one because even after the long wait of the I-526 approval, you then get the green card and then two years later, you have to remove the conditions, right? So you're in, you're going to be in the green card system if you're kind of one of the longer dated um, five-year uh, approvals, you're going to be in the green card system for a better part of 10 years, right? So it's um, because the I-829 petition also is a petition that is taking a long time to be approved. And that's another type of petition where we have successfully um, filed the mandamus petition to compel the government to adjudicate the petition faster, just just um, just given how long that uh, it was uh, it was taken because there are you know there are there is you know there there can be harm associated with these delays right like if someone is um, you know wants a green card because they've been in the U.S. for a long time and they have substantial assets there's a, a you know pretty extreme estate planning benefit of actually having the green card so if they have to that has to be <laughs> if that's drawn out for um you know many 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 years then um that 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 is actually a you know a, a big harm to the individual great thank you very much Ian. so we have not received any questions so i will go ahead and uh thank everyone thank you ian for sharing your time and exp expertise with us and thank you to the participants uh, for joining us today, please do keep an eye out for the email we'll send you all uh, with a link to future webinars, the PowerPoint, as well as our YouTube channel. We do hope to see you on future webinars. Thank you so much. Great. Actually, thank you very much, Justin. Okay, thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.